Hello and welcome to the Crap and the Crazy Parenting Podcast. I'm Tash Critter. I have a Bachelor of Education, Kindy Tier 7, and over the last 10 years we've racked up about 700 hours with early intervention therapists, including speeches, OTs, psychs, physios, the works. Uh, with my two kids with autism and one has ADHD and PDA as well. During this journey over the last 10 years, I've learned a ton of tools and strategies to understand behaviors that challenge, to implement change to support kids with additional needs, and tools and strategies that you can implement at home to keep home life calm and happy so that you can enjoy each other's company. I really hope these tips, tools, and strategies help you and that you can take these podcasts and go home and implement what we've covered. Hello and welcome to today's episode number 22. Today we are going to cover home strategies for under five-year-olds and then the next podcast will be that five to ten-year-old age group and then the next one after that will be teens. Now bear in mind I have teens now. There is a lot I remember. It's ingrained in my head. I cannot get it out about those baby years, but there's a lot that I've also forgotten too. So I have structured this around different areas of life. Um, eat the meat, take the bones, take the bones, eat the meat. No, spit the bones, take the meat. Yes, that's what I'm getting at. So take what works for you. Um, think about the actual idea behind it and see how you can uh, use it and implement it in your home life so that it will work for your family. Yes. So I'm not saying do this exactly the way I did. I'm hopefully giving you a stack of tools and strategies that you can use and adapt and adjust changes you need to work for you and your family. Yeah. So to start with, always banging on about routines, but they are so important. And this is something that I did not understand at all. When I first ended up at Nagala, we got in within what, a day, two days, I think, with all the screaming that was going on around six months old, like I just could not put my baby down. Um, didn't know about autism at this stage, didn't know he had autism at this stage. Um, so yeah, life was fun. And just going from, you know, um, I had two jobs, I think, and studying to having a baby that just didn't stop screaming and I didn't know why and I didn't know what I was doing wrong. And yeah, so hopefully if you happen to be in the same situation or if any of this is familiar to you, I'm hoping that my experience will help you. Yeah. So starting with routines and visual, visual schedules. Now these are really important um, because kids, kids in general, and then kids with additional needs, particularly autism, they need to know what to expect, yeah? Change can be scary, particularly kids with anxiety as well. Um, so they like to know what is coming next, what is expected of them, and visual schedules are a really good way to do this. Now, visual schedules look different from our little ones, and I'm not talking about babies. Routine is going to be on you and your organization when you've got little babies, but when your kids are getting to around that toddler age group, bringing in picture strips um, to help with completing tasks. If you actually look at all the skills needed to complete a task, so the executive functioning skills, which is organizing yourself, the fine motor skills, so any hand movement, gross motor skills, so full body movement. So say to get dressed in the morning, yeah? There's a ton of skills needed, firstly, to remember um, where to find things to get dressed, and then there's the skills of memory as well for the order, the sequencing of getting dressed. And then there's the actual skills of putting clothing on my body in the right order. So socks, undies first, then pants, then shirt, then jumper, then hat, say. Yeah. And we take all this for granted, but we need to teach our kids this. Yeah. And picture strips allow our kids to visually see the order of things, so for example, getting dressed, having the picture of the socks first, then the undies, then the pants, then the shirt, then the jumper. So that takes away your nagging voice to start with. Um, it gives them some ownership and responsibility. And look, they're not going to get it right to start with, even for years. Yeah. And then you're going to hit that what, two to three year old age group where they're in charge of what they put on and they're wearing the most ridiculous clothes, but you learn to pick your battles, yeah? 
but I hope you get the point of actually understanding they're not just pictures for the sake of pictures, but that they can actually help. And when there's so much going on already, so many skills that they are learning from scratch, by putting picture strips there, you're taking out that memory of how to do it, where to find things, um, and also the sequencing, yeah? And on that note, well, that was my next one. As far as where to th find things, get into the habit of having places and homes for things and then labeling them to, again, equip your little ones to, as they age up, so not having all these expectations of a toddler or three-year-old, you're going to do your own head in, set yourself up for failure, and then there's just going to be more screaming and yelling on everyone's part. But to put these things in place, and yes, it's going to take effort to start with, but that effort that you put in to start is going to save you some of those behaviors and frustrations later. Yeah. So having um, picture labels, whether you stick them on, print them out, stick them on, on the drawers. So their socks and undies are in one, jumpers, shirts, whatever, in the, however you choose to organize it. Yes. And that's going to depend on whether you've got drawers or what your storage system looks like. Um, but even for toys and getting them to take some responsibility. And it's not a huge thing. I mean, yes, it's gonna be a bit of work setting it up and having those labels to start with, but you just do that once, yeah? Until they get a bit older, and we'll talk about that in the next one. Um, but to, you know, as you're putting the books away, oh, look, there's the label of the books. We'll put the books here. And they'll eventually know where the books live, and that's where the books go. That's where we go to find the books, and that's where we put the books away, yeah? So these are, practical things that can apply for any family to make your life easier. And there is a part of you getting organized, you changing, shifting expectations, you setting your family up for success. But there's also the part of equipping our kids so we're not doing everything for them. We want to equip them to have ownership of these daily life skills so that they eventually grow into well-balanced adults. So our kids are not without all these tools and strategies and you know inputting into their life. If we keep doing things for them just because it's easier, when do they actually learn to become functioning adults? Yeah. And I know that's probably the last thing on your mind in this zero to five age group, but little things that we can start to put in place that over the years we build on. So we've got a good structure and foundation for parenting our teens. Yeah. Cause I'm at that stage and yeah, it's work. All right. So moving on to the next one, um, transitions and using timers. So We'll often find with our little ones and with kids with autism, kids with anxiety, they don't like change. They don't like things changing. They don't like their favorite activity ending and a new one starting because with something starting, that raises up that anxiety again because it's something unknown and unexpected. Timers are a great tool to use and probably visual ones at this age group. Again, I haven't done it at this early age group because I didn't know about it. Yes, so a little, I probably would have done it verbally. Um, I now have an app on my phone, which I don't use for my teenagers, but I use it for the probably that five to 10 year old age group that I work with. But it's an app on the phone and you get to set the timer. You can set it for 30 seconds, five minutes. I wouldn't be setting a timer for a toddler for five minutes because their, their experience of time is much shorter. Yeah, and you, you're going to lose them. It's a, a solid circle, so it's a solid color. And as time passes, so it shows the time as it passes, but it kind of ticks over to reveal a picture. And then there's fireworks and whatnot when the timer goes off. So we're kind of making it fun. It is very clear um, visually what is happening and how much time we have left before we move on to the next activity. Now, I'm not promising that this is going to work each and every time, even half the time, but um, it will work at least some of the time and make your life easier, yes? Now, that particular app may not work for you. You may prefer like an egg timer. So we use these um, at work as well. It is a probably, I don't know, six inches tall egg timer. So a big chunky one. And there's five minute ones and 10 minute ones. And we um, choose that depending on the age of the kid and their ability as well. So they can visually see the sand fall through the timer before it's time to move to the next activity. At home now with teens, which I will cover properly in the other podcast, I use a microwave timer. 
Yeah, so look, it just depends on your kid and their interests and um, the level of how they're functioning in the home. Yeah, so use something that is meaningful to them. And we use these transitions when we're moving from one activity to another. Um, another good way to support this as well, particularly if you're using, say, the microwave timer and then you've got the fridge there, is to have the now and next visual schedule. So we have the picture and the word of what we're doing now. So right now we're reading a book. Next, we need to go to the library. Yeah, so you would have the picture of the library on there. Now this, when you first start implementing this, particularly if you've got young ones, it's not going to mean anything. Yeah, um, as far as the picture, but as you continue to do it, as you get used to this process and this routine, then it will begin to have meaning. That will begin to take it on board and understand now and next what is happening. Um, it doesn't mean they're going to like the next activity, yeah, but you're just taking away some of that anxiety, some of the unknown. It is very clear what we're doing now. It's very clear my expectation of what we're doing next. Yeah. All right, next one, having a safe place to chill out, time out, proprioception. And I don't mean punishment time out. I mean, um, they are not coping. So we're going to move to a quieter space. Yeah. Now, if you've got little, little ones, you are going to be their quiet space. As I was with my um, first, I held him all the time all the time. I put him down for an hour at three months old and I had that rocker, oh, whoops, I had that rocker swing thing. Um, oh, that may change your life, yeah? Having those rocking, swinging, moving, so this is all proprioception. Proprioception is our body in, or our understanding of our body in the space around us, so it includes all that movement, see this in kids that can't stay still. Um, we want to give them those movement and sensory breaks to get the energy out and to then be able to focus. I will go into that more in another podcast, otherwise I'll be talking forever. So with our babies, um, my boy was happiest when I was either as a little, little baby holding tight with the shh, 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 shh over and over and over for hours. So that rocking, and I didn't understand it then, it was that auditory noise, so he loved white noise, um, would often have fans on, he'd sleep through the vacuum cleaner being on. That was interesting, discovering that one. Um, and then that, that proprioception, that tight squeeze, so I mean, don't squeeze your babies too hard, yes, but just that firm, that firm squeeze, being swaddled as well, that's another one that can work. Now some kids will hate it, Yes, um, same as, you know, some kids respond really well to that deep pressure. Others are going to absolutely hate it. So this is trial and error, what works for you and your kids. But something will work, yeah? Um, I used to, and I do it with another kid at our playgroup, so holding him around his hips, it would be, and then swinging. Now, you've got to make sure the kid's short enough and you don't smash the head on the floor, but swinging him down between the legs and then back up. Um, so we put the crash mat on the floor as well. That probably didn't make sense. You would have to see it. But swinging the kids around. Some love being upside down. Again, some will hate it. My boy absolutely loved being upside down and swung around and just loved, yeah, loved that spinning, loved that feeling. And that made him calm and happy. Whereas someone else that does not like that, that is not going to make them calm and happy. So again, finding what works for you and your kids. As our kids get older, Having a space for them, so um, headphones, if that works for them to block out the noise, having a hidey hole, like a building a tent, building a fort, or having a proper blacked out tent. Um, my kids used to have the Ikea bed with the canopy over the top and we added screens to the side. So it wasn't dark as such, but it was a safe, cozy place. Um, what else do we have? Weighted toys, but I would be super careful using them with under fours. So that are uh, weighted blankets. Um, I didn't use them at all. I hadn't actually discovered them till my kids were quite a bit older, but there have been big safety issues around using them with younger children. So I wouldn't recommend that, but you can use weighted toys. So uh, we used with my girl, the weighted beanbags, so just little, little tiny beanbags, you know the ones that you used to throw at school to get in the pot of flag races or whatever, I don't know, beanbag relay, 
Um, so little bean bags, like the ten centimeter squared bean bags, and we used to put them on her lap in the car as well as in her backpack when she was at the shops. We also had or still have a snake, um, so it's probably a meter long and about I don't know six centimeters across. And he's weighted and he sits nicely around your neck and just that weight on your shoulders is very grounding as well. Now, I wouldn't use that with a toddler. Mine were probably the four to five year old age group with using these. Uh, use your common sense, yeah. But find little things that you can use. So think about weight, think about body movement um, to yeah use as tools and just Build them into your everyday lives. So I don't mean just one activity kind of in the day with these weighted tools and whatnot. I mean using them throughout the day. So whether it's every 30 minutes or hourly and build it into your day so that there's, you know, a place in your house where your kids can go to de-escalate, to calm, to be away from the noise, be away from everyone else. For some kids that may be in front of a screen. I will cover that later. Um, as much as I don't like screens, our TV was pretty well permanently on. It didn't mean we were in front of it. So I very clearly remember Nemo. It was Nemo and Cars. Which Nemo? Oh, and then Frozen. Anyway, um, so having the TV on, my boy would be outside. So like two rooms away from the TV, outside, the door opened, so there was green. We had grass at that place. And I would then go, well, TV's on, no one's here, turn it off. He'd run back in. He could hear it from out in the garden and yeah. So anyway, I just went off on a tangent then. Use use what works for you, yeah? And that will look different from each of you, for each of you and your families. Um, my next one was movement breaks, which I've covered in the last point. Um, I've added here, allow opportunities to get energy out in a socially acceptable way. Uh, reframing this in your mind might help too. So instead of seeing it as oh, it's another thing I have to do to help my kid not be climbing the walls, see it as something that you're equipping your kid with that is going to impact their life and yours, make their life and yours easier so that you're reducing those meltdowns that tend to happen later in the day, yeah? So think of it as preventative rather than another thing I have to do, yeah? Hope that helps. Um, beach and play centre, so this is moving towards getting out of the house. How can we use that out of the house? Beach and play centres were an absolute nightmare for us. So on that note, I was thinking whole body movement, getting out of the house. Um, sand at the beach, no. Nah. And play centres were just too noisy. Mine gets very visually overwhelmed as well. Um, don't cope well. So yeah, we did find that hard. We opted for quiet parks, parks with fences, for my sanity, for my kids' safety, having gates and going to parks with gates where I knew they were enclosed, particularly if one is screaming and the other has gone off because um, you don't have eyes in the back of your head. That just was what worked for us. Bikes, having those little scooter bikes, trampoline, love trampolines, uh, digging in the sandpit, all of that is still proprioception because you're digging and there's that resistance there. Indoor swings, we had indoor swings. We've only just got rid of them in the last few years. Um, so I got the bunning swing that was like 80 bucks. We've got this kind of nook waste of space area in our house. So the swing set fit perfectly. I put foam on the legs so it didn't scratch up the walls. Then we got a massive 10 meter, eight meter, I don't know, um, length of lycra, tied two knots in the ends with the abseiling hooks. And then that was a big cuddle swing. And the kids love it. That's now moved to our Heroes building and the kids still love it there. And this is like 10 years on. Crash mats are really good, um, especially if you've got kids that love to wrestle, which I do. So wrestling is a fun one. And we do that at bedtime. They're supposed to be calm, but, you know, getting energy out, they're not going to sleep anyway. Um, so crashing onto the crash mat, having a space where you can wrestle, push on their body, push, pull, and just have that release of energy space. All right, moving on, co-regulation. So finding that middle ground, that's that's super fun as a parent. 
and it doesn't really matter what stage you're at. When my first one was little, uh, because I couldn't put him down, I was going to lose the plot, being stuck at home. But yeah, he was only happy when he was being held, so I started to meet friends at the shops. We just walk around the shops for hours. So you hold the baby and you put your shopping in the pram. But that is how life looked and worked for us. So yeah, and he didn't sleep. He just didn't sleep, maybe 10 minutes a day. Um, so it didn't matter whether I was at the shops or home. It, yeah, didn't matter. It would be interesting to see with what I know now if that would have looked different or maybe it it wouldn't have. In which case, if these tools and strategies don't work, I would find things that, well, that's what this whole section was about, that co-regulation, finding that middle ground where you can keep your sanity and they can, you know, be happy as well. Yeah, so finding that compromise, finding that balance, and that will take time. It's not something, well, sometimes you magically get it right um, and it works, but other times it's going to be that trial and error process. Um, for us, that also, as they probably that kindy pre-primary age, we'd go to Bunnings every day. And near us, or the one we went to, there was Bunnings and Office Works together. So we would go to Office Works for me to look at pretty stationery. But I'm pretty sure we would do that second after being at Bunnings, where they got the little trolleys, so they got to go around the store with them. Then there's the caged in playground, and then I think we got chop milks. Whatever we did, we did the same thing every single time. We didn't mess with that. That worked. And then I got to, because I guess they'd got their energy out, they'd had something to eat after school, so they were calm and happy. Then we got to walk around office works, which I'm pretty sure they have those little trolleys as well. And I got to do my thing. So yeah, middle ground. Uh, find your tribe. I'm always banging on about that. There are other people out there like you and your family. Yeah, particularly with autism. And it's so good. Um, so we help run a play group now, but it's so good to just hang out with other families where if your kid, I don't know, painted the dog blue that week, you can come and tell your story and there's no judgment. Yeah, it's, we get it. And for you to then find, you know, a group of people where they get it and there's not that judgment, there's not that weird side eye. Um, yeah, that's, I guess it's just a part of being human and belonging and not having to defend what life looks like. Yeah. Cause been there, done that. And it's not fun. Online shopping was another one that was a lifesaver. Wasn't available until my girl was a little bit older. So my youngest one. And now there's the, you can order online on the app and then you can drive your car up and stick it in the boot. Yeah. That's kind of cool. Um, so not having to shop with little ones because shops, you've got the bright lights, you've got the, fans and whatnot in all the air conditioner units which my boy would lie on the floor and find fans um there's people and there's just there's just lots of stuff going on all right sleep i've just got just write it off there's not much again there is no point me telling you to get more sleep so that you can be a better mum tomorrow to help manage your kid and their behaviors it's just not going to happen at this age group um so i just find joy in the small things. Um, so whether that's sitting for two minutes with coffee, if you can sit with two minutes with coffee without your walls being painted. I remember doing that once and my kids got into my, I loved my eye makeup. Um, and I guess they just thought it was pretty crayons. So it wasn't just drawing with it. It was scrubbing the grout in the bathroom with all my eye makeup. So I do get it. Um, but if you can just find Find the little things. Do the best you can. Being sleep deprived, it just sucks. Find little things that you can actually achieve. So things that bring you joy, things that you can just, you know, have a little break, relax. Whether that's meeting with another mum and your kids playing and then, you know, being able to vent and talk through. But also things that you can achieve. So writing down to-do lists and you know, it may not look like much, especially in this zero to five age group, but just acknowledging that you have actually achieved something today other than poop. Yeah. I did Avon back in the day. Um, I just had to do something. I, this brain does not work with just boobs and poop. So yeah, that was something that I could do. That was getting out of the house. It was movement for me. Um, he was fine as long as I was holding him, especially if we were outside. And it was, yeah, just something to use my brain cells. All right, I didn't realize how long I have talked for. I am going to end it here and continue next week in part two.
Bye.